on our Play of the Year leaderboard at 3-1 and one against Brian Brondewin, who is also 3-1 and one playing Black Green Delirium. So both players have seven cards, and they'll be giving the thumbs up and the green light here. And round number five, our first of standard will be underway in just a moment. Uh, Brian Brondewin here, uh, a, a player with a long trek record of doing very well day one of Invitationals and has had some, some very disappointing second days. He has. We've seen a lot of XO starts from him, even as deep as, you know, like 11-0. Yes. You know, stuff like that. You see both these players starting off with Creature Lands for Brian. It was a hissing quagmire into a Sylvan Advocate. For Kent, it's just a lumbering falls. So Ketter will draw. Brian has had tough day ones, and Kent has been really good at getting ninth. Yep. Uh, two years ago, two ninth place finishes in Invitationals, as there is a Prairie Stream, and he'll just simply pass the turn back. So Brian will be able to come across here for two points of damage in just a moment with the Advocate. Ketter's going to fall down to 18, and we'll see what Brian's third turn does bring. It is a transgress the mind. Let's see what Kent Ketter is working with. Not one, but two copies of Collective Company. Can say the same thing about Thalia. And then you'll see a Selfless Spirit and a copy of Dromoka's Command, and then just that single planes. To note, as Brian will select a card here in Collective Company, the Dromoka's Command count is something we have to keep attention of here, as Paul Rietzel did make the top eight of Grand Prix Portland with none in his main deck. For Kent, he's got two. I've been looking at some builds. I know uh, former Pro Tour champion and former coverage colleague Osa Lovadovich is playing Band Company with zero main deck copies of Dromoka's Command. It is a card that does get sided out a lot, as there is a Thalia. Heretic Cathar, you see Brian is sacrificing and shuffling his Evolving Wilds, getting a basic swamp out of his deck, shortcutting a little bit here. Got to save a little bit of time with that Evolving Wilds. This Thalia, very good. Three mana, three, two with first strike. Creatures and non-basic lands, your opponent's control, enter the battlefield tapped. A lot of relevant text on that three, two first strike here. And given how many very powerful three toughest creatures there are in standard, three power first striker is, is size to brawl. That's a tireless tracker. There is a Blighted Fen. A clue is on the way. Now, if you've been watching us all day, you got to watch Modern first. A little bit different here. Yep. Things are a lot slower. Now, that tireless tracker should be entering the battlefield tap, so we will try to get that fixed up here really quick. Thanks to the old Thalia, of course. And they fixed that. And this is not a trigger or anything, no, so it's no, not. No. Just has to happen. Ketter will serve in here for three, maybe. Looks like he will. No good blocks here for Brian. Here's Dramoka's command before damage. Plus one, plus one counter. Fight the tracker. This is awkward. Okay. See, because Thalia becomes a 4 3. Okay. That's not good. It's not good. And Kent realized, there go the glasses. <laughs> What's that line from, from Osib's Pro Tour coverage? That's the look of a man who just made an excellent play. He made an error. <laughs> he made an error. Uh, a basic forest here for Brian. That'll be land number five. We have, you know, it's, it's unfortunate, but the reality of the situation is we have seen Kent maybe get a little ahead of himself sometimes when he's in the future match area. Yes. Yeah, I think there has definitely been a habit to play a little too fast and loose. Yeah. For sure. Some nerves when he's on the camera. There's another advocate. Pass the turn back. Now there's a basic land. Now, the tricky thing here. So he's going to leave a four mana for Collector Company, obviously. The tricky thing, for lack of a better term, it's how you overcome a mistake like that. Yep. You've got people watching at home. You know, you're against a great player, and Brian Brondone is headed to Worlds very soon here. And yeah, you just made a horrible blunder that you would not make in most circumstances. Well, the game's not over. There's still plenty of magic to be played. And with land number four, Collector Company could catch him all the way back into this. Exactly. Here come the advocates. Here comes Collector Company. That part's obvious. Top six. We'll see if he's got two he wants to take. There's at least one Reflector Mage there because... There always is. Are you new here, as right. you like to say? You've played Magic before. I have. It's weird because because Reflector Mage is... I, I don't. Someone can do the math better than me. What, 40-ish percent to be in your opening hand? And that's seven cards? I think so. So how is it 100% to be in a collected, <laughs> in a collected company 
which is only six cards. Like the math doesn't square, and yet I live in the world. I only see what I see, you know what I mean? So what, what other conclusion can I draw here? We can only com comment on what's in front of us. Exactly. And every time a collective company is cast, a Reflector Mage is part of the puzzle. Reflector Mage does come down. It's going to bounce Sylvan Advocate. That will be a double block. Going to make Brian have a removal spell here. I think he's going to put Reflector Mage first, potentially. Actually, put that second so that Advocate kills Nyssa. But what that does more than anything is it just gets removal spell out of Brian's hand. Although that is a, I mean, that is a fairly risky block. I can, I can appreciate wanting to get the Advocate off the table before Brian gets to his sixth land. I respect that, but that is a, a pretty risky block in that spot. The chances of something going right there, I think, are pretty slim, yeah. as there's a tireless tracker. That is a land, a clue on the way for Ketter. The follow-up is a selfless spirit, and now he will pass the turn back over to BBD. I think Brian picked up a copy of Emrakul. That's not land number six, for those of you keeping track at home. Got a ways to go here. Although, I guess, get there a little sooner than you'd expect. Yeah? There's a spell. There's an instant down there. There's a, there's a land. There's a creature. There's a sorcery. So we're already at nine. It's already at nine. It's kind of incidentally in the deck. There is Liliana, the last hope. Selfless Spirit, going to sacrifice that in response. There's an Advocate. Pass that turn back. We're going over to Ketter. He'll draw a card here in just a moment. Tyler's Tracker is still alive. Sylvan Advocate the draw. Remember, Ketter does have another copy of Thalia in hand. He'll start by sacrificing a clue. Counter going to go onto the Tracker. He'll draw a card. Spell Queller in hand. This is kind of that soupy Bant Company mess of creatures. And standard is a lot of the soupy mess right now. Yeah. This is one of the least linear formats I can recall ever seeing in standard. Uh, and that's why the games are so hard to play, because it's very rarely, yeah, I'm just curving out and tapping out for all this stuff that just, you know, kind of works on its own, and my opponent's doing the same thing. The games shift a lot. It's a not easy to play these games in my mind. Keter was hoping to find a land. He didn't find one. We might see that other copy of Thalia come down here in just a moment. We'll see. He's got a couple of three-minute spells. He's going to go with the Tireless Tracker. It's simply past the turn back. So let's go back over to Brondoon. He'll draw a card. Is it land six? It does not appear to be. Brian's build of Delirium a little bit interesting here this weekend. We know he's got the Ember Pool in hand. He's also got a main deck copy of Woodland Bellower here this weekend. Two Ishkana. And a main deck copy of Guilt Leaf Winnower. He's going to serve in here with both advocates. Remember, he's threatening the Liliana on the battlefield here, so he does have a way to take out the four through Tireless Tracker uh, should Ketter decide to block there. Also has the ability to actually get back one of the advocates as well if they both die. Yep. So, a lot of options with that powerful Planeswalker. Pretty simple block there. Tracker going to trade with Advocate. Two damage going to come across to Ketter. Next up for Brian. It's a ruinous path. See you later, Tireless Tracker. The follow-up is another advocate, plus Liliana, and now pass the turn back. Over to Kent we go. It's an Issa. A trigger will allow Ketter to search up a forest, and there is that forest. That'll be his land for the turn. Land number six, for those of you counting at home, Got to keep track of all those Sylvan Advocates out there. Ketters will be a 4-5 if he does play it, and he will. And now he'll pass the turn back over to Brian. Brian's still on the hunt for land number six. He's had five for a while. He'll draw a card. I think he may have found it. He will start by minusing Liliana. Sylvan Advocate, I believe another copy of Liliana, head to the graveyard. Now Brian gets to return something. Meaningful also because that is now a fifth card type in the graveyard. It is. Well, uh, excuse me, Emrakul down to eight. Yep. Brian going to get back a tracker. Might be thinking a little card advantage here as he does play the tracker. There is the land in Hissing Quagmire. A clue, but maybe more importantly, those advocates are four fives. They're coming on in. 
And I think BBD trying to kind of square up here and get the best of both worlds where he can win the short game just with the pressure that he has. And with Tireless Tracker alongside Emerald Cool in hand, he's got a very good long game path as well. Ketter going to take all the damage here. That's land number seven. That's a Yavimaya Coast. A Grasp of Darkness is going to take care of that Nissa. However, Spell Queller is here to take care of the Grasp of Darkness. So now Nissa will transform. The Sage Animus has arrived. It starts on three counters. How Ketter wants to use it is anyone's guess. To note, however, look at the way Ketter tapped his mana. Yep. Has no access to white mana right now. Could have used the Lumbering Falls instead of the Prairie Stream. And now all of a sudden, he actually can't play the Spell Queller that he just revealed to Nissa. But we've also had a Thalia in hand uh -huh. as well. Let's to transgress the mind. Let's get a better look at Ketter's hand here, says Brian. You see a Thalia, the Spell Queller, and another copy of Selfless Spirit. Selfless Spirit looking pretty bad when there's a Liliana over there. Yeah. Just a very painful tapping there for, for Ketter. Three mm -hmm. white cards in hand. There you go. Having a Thalia in play when Ketter's getting to the spot where he wants to start cobbling together double blocks, uh, that's, a, that's a big loss. And Brian, I think, is ticking up Liliana here on the Advocate. And what's that going to allow him to do? Is it's going to allow him to make some really nice attacks. Yeah, Brian has found the winning line. He's going to take it, and he's going to win this game. So Brian Brondon is going to win game number one here over Kent Ketter. Black Green Delirium up a game here over Bant Company. As it's time to take a look at the sideboards here for both players, Kent Ketter will be on the play. So we'll take a look at two Negates, two Ojatai's Command, two Dromoka's Command, two Stasis Snare, two Tamiyo Field Researcher, two Tragic Arrogance, a Clash of Wills, a Gideon Ally of Zendikar, and a Selfless Spirit. Uh, you could definitely talk me into the two copies of Tragic Arrogance and the two copies of Tamiyo. I think they're just... Two cards very well suited to give you an edge in mid-range creature matchups. And I think the two copies of Stasis Snare here, you know, Ketter is probably more in the market for effects that exile. And just a lot of, you know, random 3-4 mana creatures floating around in Brian's deck. It's a, a fine removal spell for the matchup. On the other side of things here for BBD, he's got an Orbs of Warding. Somebody doesn't want to lose the blue-red this weekend. Two Call the Bloodline that cost a Caterpillar, a Kalita's Trader at Get. Two Languish, two Infinite Obliteration, two Dead Weight, two Transgress the Mine, and two copies of Duress. Uh, probably get a little bit more of the discard going in. Duress is a little narrow for this matchup because so much of Ketter's deck is uh, creatures. But Transgress the Mine is an easy card to bring in. Uh, I think the two copies of Languish are well suited for this matchup. And I, I think that Kalidas can come in as well. Well, there are the options there for both players. Sideboarding does take a little bit longer in standard because you see all these twos and ones for both players. They've got to figure out not only what they're going to bring in, but what they're going to take out. So while they do that, let's talk about regionals for season number three on the SCG Tour. Regionals have been such a successful program. We want to thank everybody at home who's played in our regional championships this year. And season three will hopefully be no different October 15th. You do see the playmat here. It's the Wings of Glass playmat along with the token Robin Alfard. Free and exclusive playmat to to the first 200 players who do sign up for their regionals. Now, more information, well, there's cash and prizes involved, which is pretty sweet because, look, I don't want to play for nothing. Right. I certainly want to play for something. So $1,200 and 20 SCG points for first place. Also a qualification to one of our invitationals, our most... Our, our one next, most, re most recent, excuse me, on the schedule is in Atlanta. So hopefully we'll see you guys there in December. And we even have our locations now, Patrick, where we'll be going all across the country. A little return to the Pacific Northwest as well. 15 locations for you to choose from on August 6th. Go to starcitygames.com slash regionals. Plant your flag. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm looking I'm, forward to it. I remember, as always, this is occurring Pro Tour weekend. So if you're not qualified for the Pro Tour, just go over to go.crcgames.com slash regionals. Find the regional championship closest to you. Game number two going to be underway here between Ketter and Brian Braun Dewan. And we will learn a little bit more about Kent Ketter here. Number 20 on our Player of the Year leaderboard is the member of Team Card Hoarder, 28 years old from Bloomington, Indiana. Five open top eights for him. He's really good at getting second and ninth, unfortunately. But he is an Operation Iraq Freedom Veteran. The U.S. Army and Indiana University student. First ever FNM deck contained <laughs> seven Seed of the Synods. I forgot about that. And enjoys mustard, apparently, on his frozen pizza, something I cannot approve of. Good guy. We've known him for a little while. Really like Ken a lot. And, and to his credit, if it was legal to play seven copies of Seed of the Synod, he did identify a powerful card. That's it's not true. Like, it's not like he had seven copies of something bad in this deck. It's just, just not how the game works. You just, you just can't do that. Yep. That's just not something that you can do. 
Uh, Brian Brondoon currently up a game. Ketter will be on the play here for game number two. Now, not Ketter's best played game. No. We can be honest here in the booth. It was not. It wasn't fluid ballet, as you like to say. But the standard is a very, uh, you know, none of the, those two uh, moments in question were, were the most complicated lines in the world. But uh, I think the standard format is very complicated in terms of how the games play out. I think it is a very skill-intensive format because it's, it's very rarely just I'm doing this one linear proactive thing and that's that's good enough to win. You have to be reevaluating every single turn. Combat math and, and creature combat in general is a big part of the game. And I think BBD just navigated that game a lot more confidently in those spots than, than Kent did. Yeah, I totally agree. And you know, Kent is not one who will shy away from it. He'll probably be walking over the booth saying, I just played game one horrible. Yep. Truly horrible. But fortunately for him, there's a game two and potentially a game three. So you got to play on. Dust off the mistakes as there's an evolving wilds and keep battling. For Brian, he started things off with a Hissing Quagmire yet again. He'll use that Hissing Quagmire to play and traverse the Uvenwald. No Delirium here, though there is now a Sorcery in his graveyard. He'll search for a Basic Swamp. Ketter would like to shortcut and sacrifice the Evolving Wilds. That's exactly what he's going to do. We'll see what Landy wants to grab. See, Brian's actually going to play Hissing Quagmire, not the Swamp he searched for. Ketter's going to get a basic island, which leads me to believe he's got some green mana in his hand, and all the colors of the Bant deck will be online here in just a moment. A Forest and a Thalia. And now he'll pass the turn back with the Stacey Snare and a Reflector Mage in hand. Over to Brian we go. Two mana. Grasp is going to take care of that. There is a Blighted Fen. And now we go back over to Kent. This is a Tireless Tracker. That is a Prairie Shroom. There's the battlefield on tap, thanks to all those basics. A Clue, which is our good friend Max Mafidi, our Columbus Invitational Champion earlier this year. And now we go back over to Brian. Three mana here from BBD. Tireless tracker of his own. Evolving Wilds means he's going to get two clues. A little clue advantage there. And with how these games kind of shake out, it almost seems like whoever's, whoever has more clues is in better shape. Yep, it, it can definitely drag out. Uh, also noteworthy now, third car type in the graveyard for BBD. One of the harder ones to get in the graveyard as well. So now any creature trade that occurs, it's got Delirium. Capsule gets on tap with an active Tireless tracker. Do you see a fortified village in hand? He'll start by sacrificing the clue. Counter there, card on the way. There is a fortified village. And you got any reveals? Yes, basic forest. There's a clue. And now, I think it might be, I thought it might be your favorite card. Not yet time for reflective mage. No. Going to use a stasis snare instead. Here's an attack for four. And Kent's got a pretty good advantage right now. So back over to BBD we'll go. He'll play a land. And now he'll use Grasp to take care of the tracker, followed up with a Liliana. Plus it and pass it. What do you think about Liliana in this format? Um, I'm not sure that I want to have you know, four copies in the main. I'm not that high on it, though. BBD's deck has got different incentives to be playing with Liliana. Uh, I think it's certainly a powerful card. And uh, if you expect a lot of copies of Selfless Spirit floating around, not an unreasonable call for this format, yeah. then it becomes even better. It kind of impressed me last week in a Grand Prix Portland. It looked like a heck of a magic card. Certainly not one I wanted to play against when I was playing humans. Three mana Planeswalkers, uh, they have a habit of showing up. The track record's good. Grapple with the past is the play. So Brian turns over the top three cards. The forest to the slaughter. You don't see that one a ton. And a land of war waste. Now he gets to return either a land or a creature to his hand. Brian with some options down there in the graveyard. So we'll see what he does want to select. He'll go with Evolving Wilds. So he's done grappling for now. There's Runa's path to take care of the tracker. Liliana's going up, slow down the advocate. And now he will sacrifice the Evolving Wilds and shortcut a little bit. Both players with two clues on the battlefield. 
Ketter. I'm going to start by sacrificing one of them. He'll draw. Just one clue left now. A lot of Reflector Mages in hand. Sacrifice another clue. Draw another card. Remember, the Advocate's a little bit lower because of Liliana. So I think it's attack for two here. Another Advocate, and now passing the turn back, will Ketter over to BBD. Brian will draw. And now he'll sacrifice a clue to draw a card. Going to tick up the Liliana, play Ishkana with a Delirium. BBD has just had done such a good job this game, tapping out every turn for mm -hmm. things that are relevant. And I think Ketter just down to a couple of Reflector Mages in hand. Not great in this spot. No. I believe... I believe we have Spiders on the way. Maybe not. Maybe no Delirium for Brian right now, actually. I think it's... Oh. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's just it's just land, sorcery, instant. Instant, yeah. Oh, now he's got Delirium because the Planeswalker just died. But at least there's a one-turn delay here before he's able to get Ishkana back on, onto the battlefield. And in the meantime here, Kenner just applying a ton of pressure. Yeah, third Sylvan Advocate. All of a sudden, Brian's in quite a bit of trouble. That Ishkana was not able to stabilize this game at all. Yep, I was uh, under the assumption that BBD had Delirium set up. Yeah, me he's too. He's been gone, going on for so long and his graveyard's so stocked, but... He was a card type short. Yep. And he can't replay Ishkana with Delirium right now. And he's facing down 14 on the board right now, Patrick. Yes. He'll play a land and just simply pass the turn back. Well, it leads me to believe he's got something. Well, it's more than 14, too, because of Kenner's Lumbering Falls. Very true. That thing's enormous with all those advocates out there. And Ketter realizes that. You see him go reaching for the Lumbering Falls right away. Going to tap a bunch of mana to activate it. And here come the Knuckleheads. Looks like Hissing Quagmire is going to go active. It will block Lumbering Falls, maybe. Yes. A rule spell here from Brian, most likely. Yep. So to the slaughter. That's a negate. That's the game. Ken Ketter is going to tie things up here over Brian Rondouin. Bant Company, Black Green Delirium, getting ready here for game number two. Now, that's a little bit better played game there from Ketter. Yeah, that was yeah. sharp. Yeah. Now, are you maybe a little surprised to see Negate here after Cyborg? Uh, no, I, th I think the, there's two reasons. One is there's all, already a lot of spells in, in BBD's deck, and there's some of the better cards in the matchup. And the second thing, if your opponent has anything in their sideboard, it's much more likely to be spells rather than creatures. And Kent really has to respect Languish out of the sideboard as well. So I think there's a lot of matchups where you would not necessarily want Negate in your deck game one, but given how your opponent is likely to sideboard, it becomes an attractive post-board card, and I think this is the type of matchup where that's the case. Plus, I think he's got some cards that are not terribly attractive, like Selfless Spirit against a Liliana deck. Right. Anything like that is an easy cut. Yeah. And also, it's just a kind of a low-impact card in a, in a matchup in, where the games are likely to go pretty long. Well, these players will shuffle up and get ready here for game number three. Doesn't look like they're going to change too much. So let's talk about the StarCityGames.com newsletter very quickly. It is your source for Magic the Gathering news, and best of all, it is free to sign up for. You can sign up right now at go.starcitygames.com slash newsletter. The newsletter, newsletter cultivates kind of all the information that's going on with Star City Games. Latest information on the SCG Tour with a selected SCG Tour match of the week. Exclusive deck lists and advice from some of your favorite columnists. You get to catch up on all the event results and exclusive Cardboard Crack comic. Again, signing up is free over at go.starcitygames.com slash newsletter. Now, Brian Brondouin has had one heck of a year. We used to see him a lot on the SCG Tour. He's turned his focus to the Pro Tour, and it's worked out very well for the 30-year-old from Roanoke, Virginia, with 14 open top eights, only just one win, and then four invitational top eights. He was studying computer science before he decided to turn his attention to magic, which certainly paid off. Was his high school valedictorian, and he learned to actually play magic in college. He has been playing as long as everybody else has. Got enough of, just enough of an education to learn how to play magic, then packed his bags, now he's doing this. Yeah, he's doing okay for himself. Going to the World Championships. Con congratulations to him. Yeah, for sure. Not a small accomplishment. Uh, he's another one of the players that we got to watch a lot on the SCG Tour start from kind of nothing and become what he's become today. Yep. 
It's been a lot of fun to see. And it wasn't like BBD spiked one random event to get oh, to the World no. Championship. This was a this was a grind. Yeah. So much work done by him to go to Worlds at PAX in a week or so. Ketter is going to keep with the scry, keep six cards. I think it's two weeks away. It's very close. It's very close. I know that he is heading to he's heading to Seattle after this tournament. Yep. To just get accustomed to the time zone change, and start testing. And believe you me, there's a good place. To, if there's any place to spend an extra week of time in, it's, Seattle it's, is a fine choice. It's Seattle, Washington. It's no Central New Jersey, but it uh, is not bad. Well, really, what is though? You know what is? Right. Exactly. Where did we eat dinner yesterday? Stuff Your Face. Great place. Stuff Your Face was great. Great then place. Then we went to Thomas Sweets. I didn't know they had one of those in New Brunswick when I was a kid. Yeah. They only had one in Princeton, but I guess it's probably been around oh, for is a while. Is that now. like a local chain? Uh, I don't even know if I would call it a chain. Okay. It was just a, a random one of ice cream parlor in Princeton. Successful enough, they opened up a second one down there, and now they got one in the other big college town in New Jersey. Well, I'm just hoping we go back. We will. Good. Good answer. Several times. They make, they make a mean Oreo milkshake. Yeah. An island here for Ketter. And now there is a Sylvan Advocate that's probably going to die. At least the way Ketter played it, he expects it to die, and it will. A Grasp of Darkness will take care of the 2-3. Brian falling down to 19 to cast it, thanks to the Lana or Waste. Another Lana or Waste here for Brian, and now it is Tireless Tracker. To Kent we go. Prairie Stream enters the battlefield untapped, and looks like Spellcaller might be at the ready. Kenton did have a copy of Reflector Mage, but elected not to play it. Maybe a little surprised by that? Well, I think he's trying to sit back here uh, on both his copy of Negate and his copy of Spellqueller. Uh, with Collecting Company in hand, he's got to play the following turn that can probably catch him up to the Tireless Tracker. Evolving Wilds here from Brian. He'll play that, sacrifice another lander as the battlefield. So not one, but two clues here for BBD. Beatdowns. My guess is that Ketter is showing a lot of respect for Liliana. Reasonable. Well, there is Liliana. I believe this might be Clash of Wills, perhaps, but it's actually going to be Spellqueller. Yeah, I can, I can respect it going with the Spellqueller there, because with a negate in hand, you can handle a removal spell on the Spellqueller. Mm -hmm. So might as well get a little tempo for your trouble. Ketter with another copy of Evolving Wilds, but he's just going to go with the planes, attack for two here. BBD going to fall down to 16, and we're going to head back his way. He's got two clues on the battlefield, four lands, and a tireless tracker that is looking to grow. But actually, I believe Brian should probably be at 15. No, no, four, no 16's right. He's, he's cast a Grasp that involved one Land of War Waste, yep. and he cast the tireless tracker, which involved one Land of War Waste. And two damage from the spell caller. Yep. And then one more from Liliana. So I believe 15 is the right life total. Right, right, right. Yep, yep. yep. And they've got it all up to speed now. As you see, Brian is at 15. We're good. We got it. Mental Waste is good. It's not that good. Sack a clue. Put a counter on the tracker, and Brian will draw a card. Hissing Quagmire's a land, second clue on the way. No attacks. But do you company now? I actually kind of like this. Yep. You don't want your spell caller to get killed. Uh huh. So you want to sit on the negate. Also, you are kind of selling here to BBD that you don't have it. Yep. It takes a lot of discipline here to, to not fire that off. Now it's Reflector Mage. All right, see you later, Tracker. Grapple with the past. And I had to imagine this, this negate from Ketter's perspective is just on removal detail. He's not fighting over stuff like this. Two languishes and an Ishkana have been turned over with the grapple. So if Kent wasn't sure if Brian had languish, well, he knows now. But two of them have just been placed in the graveyard. Ishkana goes back to the grip. The graveyard? Well, no delirium just yet. Instant sorcery land.
Brian in a little bit of trouble right now. And I do not believe Delirium at this point. Transgress the mine. Brian wants to see exactly what the heck's going on here. Now there is the hand. There goes the company. Just to land. And a clash of wills. Ah, one in the sideboard. Yep. Not as good as Negate right now. Yeah. I like this line a little bit less from Ketter if it was Clash of Wills and not Negate. Sure. Because there's just no guarantee your Clash actually stops what you're hoping for. With Negate, you have a lot of protection on your Spell Queller. Now even something like Grasp gets the job done. Here's Nissa. I almost think he ha- mm. Nah, he doesn't have to do anything. I was thinking he might have to Clash this, but I just don't think that's true. The other issue with clashing this is then it's card type number four in the graveyard. Yeah, that's true. And then there's the Ishkana that he knows about where uh, Ketter's Battlefield is not better than Ishkana right now. But Ketter's Battlefield is actually better than Nissa. Yes. Yeah. I mean, usually when you, ha you know, when your opponent's seen the clash and you have an opportunity to use it for pretty good value, you should take it. But I, I think getting that, that card type in the graveyard there is the tipping point for it's just better for Kent to let it resolve. Evolving Wilds past that turn back. Brian's got six lands. We'll see if he has land number seven to transform the Nissa here momentarily. He'll draw a card. He's at eight. The other thing, too, about that last turn where Brian did play Nissa into the Clash for one, he thought about it. Yep. You know, almost in a way of saying, okay, I'm going to throw away this card. I'll let you counter this one. I've got bigger plans for the future turns. And now every spell that he's playing, he's playing it as a test spell. Is this the real one, or is this the fake one? Ketter's not sure. But it looks like he cares about Tireless Tracker enough to at least consider clashing it. Well, I don't know what the line of play here is. If he, like, what is his, the long-term play here if Ketter's going to be countering here? Because... Uh, I don't know what he's doing about the Ishkana on the follow-up. Mm -hmm. Now here's Ruin's path to take care of the Spell Queller. Now Liliana's back here for Brian. And Liliana does a great job of checking the Reflector Mage, which he just did. If I was in Ketter's position, my line would be, I will counter a removal spell on Spell Queller, I will counter Ishkana, and everything else has to go. Yep. I think that's the kind of the corner he got painted into. It doesn't look like it mattered all that much because BBD's hand's so stocked that he would have been able to work around all this anyway. Gideon. Didn't expect to see that. I think we'll see a 2-2 Knight Ally here in just a moment. We do. Pass that turn back. Uh, also, a card I would not have anticipated in the matchup. Well, I will say this. The problem I have with Gideon in this matchup is, I, sure, I think there are spots that it can be good, but if you were paying attention in game two, Brian showed you two copies of To the Slaughter. Yep. I don't want to get two for one by that thing, and it's not hard for him to actually turn it on. No guarantee that he has it, but typically you'll see one of those throughout the 75 of these Black Green Delirium decks. Brian showed you two in game number two. Traverse. Brian's on the hunt. Oh, the very crafty blighted fed. It's line number seven for the Nissa. It is. Got five man available to activate it if you'd like. Yep. Land number seven for the Ishkana activation as well. Very true. Nissa has transformed. Plus it, revealed a swamp that went on the battlefield. Now we got ourselves a little Planeswalker War. On Brian's side, he's got a Liliana last opening, Nissa Sage Animus for Kent. Maybe he's got the best of the bunch here in Gideon, Ally of Zendikar, as Brian's going to tap a lot of mana for Ishkana. And once again, no delirium. That's been the biggest problem here for Brian in these last two games. I think there's the tireless tracker in the graveyard that got countered. Oh, he that, has that's it this the fourth. Time. Okay, yeah, yeah, excuse yeah. me. He does have it this time. Excuse me. That's why I was mentioning before that I didn't like Kent's line there of countering the Clash of Wills because he knows about the Ishkana and that's the fourth card type in the graveyard. Got it. Now 
On top of, I just don't know if Kent can really like win fights over things like Tireless Trekker, given how tenuous his board is. You might have to let some of that stuff go. Gideon comes rumbling across for five, gets blocked very quickly. Brian's going to draw a card now by sacrificing a clue. I'll draw for his turn. Kind of have to work on tracking Delirium a little bit better. Hard to see the graveyard. And this is, a, you're getting a little bit of the, what I was talking about before with the, you know, you just have to respond to each game as its own thing, and uh, each board as its own unique state in the standard format. The games are not super linear. BBD won game one by being the beatdown, mm -hmm. and now game three, it looks like he's just out grinding Kent. Yeah, same deck, it's just, and a lot of the same cards too, yep. it's just the texture of the game's different. Maybe that's the appeal of a deck like this for Brian. Can play maybe both sides. I think standard, all the decks in standard have this, are not all of them. There are some extreme edge cases, like, you know, for example, Blue Red Thermal Alchemist, kind of all those beat down, Black White Control, kind of always a control deck, but all the things in the middle, uh, they can do either role. It's a Woodland Bellower. Oh, it looks like we've paused play for a moment. Okay, there we go. So a lot of the times what you're going to see from Woodland Bellower is it's, yeah, sure, it's a 6 mana 6 5, but in reality, Six mana, six five. They get a four five Sylvan Advocate. Yep, that's what it actually does. So it brings you ten power and ten toughness across two creatures. Cool to see this card show up. When it got previewed, I was one of the doubters. Just thought for six mana, there's a lot, there's a lot of ways to get two for ones for six mana in standard. Well, Not short on that. One of the things that they did here is they kind of lowered the power level by making it a non-legendary yeah. creature, which I think is probably for the best. You would probably get a legendary creature most of the time. I think you'd search for <laughs> Nissa a lot. Right, yes. You know? I'll search for this, get my seventh land, transform it the next turn or the same turn, and all of a sudden, you can't keep up with this card advantage. Yep, a couple of lands in hand here for Kent, and he's going to concede the game. Brian Rondu is going to win this match here over Kent Ketter. Two games to one. Black Green Delirium will take care of Band Company. And for BBD, a deck that he did so well with at Grand Prix Portland, he is 1-0 here with this very innovative Black Green Delirium deck. Yep. I think Kent's recipe for the matchup kind of has to be the beatdown deck. I don't think he wins long games very effectively here, and that's more or less how he got the second game in game three there. Uh, there were some spots where Kent, you know, he got to Reflector Mage a thing, and he got to Spell Caller a main face spell. These are the, the types of things you want to be doing, but just couldn't apply enough pressure. And uh, once BBD was able to get a shop set up, you saw, you know, an endless sea of clues, Ishkana that this deck doesn't really handle very well, and uh, Kent tapped out rather than wait for the inevitable. Yeah, the question, of course, is how is he supposed to use a Spell Queller, and how is he supposed to use the Clash of Wolves in that game, but also, how was he supposed to do that collective company? Because he never actually got to cast it. Exactly. I, you know, I, I, I misidentified the card in hand. Unfortunately, I thought it was negate. When I thought it was negate, I, I thought the line was a little tricksy, but I could get behind it with Clash of Wills not being that hard of a counter, not being that great at protecting the spell queller. I think he just needed to tap out, try to push to his advantage. And you saw what happened when the game slowed down there. Once it bogged down, it, it came basically just drawing to Collected Company as his way to gas back up, mm -hmm. and BBD has all sorts of ways to clutter up the board.